Hi everyone, I'm Shauna and welcome to the channel. Welcome into another day of Vlogmas and today I'm going to be talking about contentment. Contentment is a hallmark of minimalism and even if minimalism isn't for you, this is the principle that I think a lot of us would benefit from, <laughs> not just from having it, but from strengthening what we already have and also just getting good at practicing contentment. It's certainly a skill. Now, if you're on this channel, chances are you're probably already interested in talking about this subject or maybe strengthening this skill too. And so I hope that today we can talk about some ways to do that. A friend of mine said recently that contentment is realizing what you have and appreciating it. We are in a cultural moment and maybe more than a moment that makes us want to feel discontent. Makes It makes us want to feel unhappy with what we already have and we're in a perpetual state of not good enough. We're always looking for the newer, nicer, cooler thing. And we do those things for a lot of reasons. We search for these things for a lot of reasons. And there's a lot of things that help us feel in this constant state of discontent. And there's also a lot of ways to push back on that and cultivate skills and habits to help us practice contentment. Marketing tells us over and over again that buying this new thing will help us feel better. We'll have greater happiness, our life will be improved, we'll have better self-esteem from buying this new thing. And feeling those ways, having good self-esteem, having good happiness or just happiness is not going to come from this outward turning. It's going to come from internal work. So today I want to shift focuses just a little bit, although I do believe that contentment is totally bound in with consumerism. We're just going to put contentment at the heart of the topic today and I think we'll see the benefits of that as we go. So I'm going to talk about strategies and ways that we can put contentment first and get better at practicing the art of contentment. So I think that the essence of contentment is noticing the good around you, the beauty of life. So the first part of the video and I think the biggest section is going to be talking about ways to do that and then the second part of the video, which is going to be a much smaller section, is going to talk about ways ways of limiting things that can make us feel discontent. Number one is learn the art of noticing. In a book called The Upward Spiral, Dr. Alex Korb shares an interesting statistic and idea. One that is probably not new to any of us, but a great reminder and something that I think many of us find interesting in itself. On average, people notice more bad things than good things. And the bad things tend to resonate with us longer. So we're on average, and this is an average by the way. So he said, on average, we need to notice about three good things to equal out one bad thing. And if you are I mean, some people can be a little bit more sensitive than others, like you might need four, somebody might need two, but your ratio goes up if you're experiencing something like depression or anxiety. So if we want to come out neutral in a day, like we want to feel more positive, we want to feel, let's say, more content, then we need to get better at noticing the good around us to help us appreciate it day to day. And so there's two things we can do here. The first thing is getting better at noticing the good around us, like I was just saying. So you're on your commute. The train station was quiet today. I did not have to wait in line at the drive-thru today. And getting better at noticing those things in the moment, but that can be hard. And a way to maybe get to that place to be able to start thinking those thoughts organically in the moment is to take time at your end of at the end of the day to reflect and we'll talk about that in just a second so one of the strategies that dr alex korb does share in his book the upward spiral um, is non-judgmental noticing and this is noticing without reacting emotionally and this strategy is intended to be put in place or to be used when we're 
noticing all of the bad things and then maybe getting angry at our reaction. Because what he says is that noticing a mistake might automatically trigger the emotional amygdala. And by becoming aware of your own reaction and how you react to your surroundings and to the thing, it activates the prefrontal cortex, which calms the amygdala. So when you, so his example is when you get annoyed that you're stuck at the red light, think something like, oh, that's interesting. I noticed this red light, but I never noticed any of the other green lights I had over here. So this is a practice that helps us think about how we react emotionally to things, but it also helps us try to notice the positives. You might be thinking, Sean, how does this relate to contentment in general? And my, my honest thought is that if we are reacting emotionally and we have this as a habit and we have so much emotion tied into negativity or we are able to get emotionally kind of pulled in or react negatively often, that can reflect our mood and it can reflect our state of mind kind of day to day. And I think a lot of us, myself included, would be happier if I could experience less anger, less frustration at the day-to-day -day things and learn to let some of that go, but more importantly, get better at noticing the positive things around us, which is what I think the, uh, the whole goal of non-judgmental non noticing is in the first place. The second thing is to start a gratitude practice, which is really tied into what I was just talking about. There's a significant amount of evidence out there that tells us how powerful the art of gratitude is or the habit of gratitude is. We need to get better at noticing things in our lives to be grateful for, and that's a, that's a practice that needs to be cultivated. Gratitude has been shown to increase our happiness, positivity, and it can help us notice more positive things in our lives. And it's also shown to help people with depression and anxiety. By actively thinking about and spending time curating a list of things we're grateful for each day can be so powerful in changing our outlook, especially if we're caught in this frame of thinking of, I'm not good enough, I don't have enough, I am not enough. That type of thinking can keep us caught in these cycles of displeasure, unhappiness, Un like unfulfillment, discontent, and always focusing on what you don't have and not appreciating what you do. Maybe at first this feels a little bit forced, like you're, you're having trouble thinking of what you want to appreciate. And I think this is the most powerful reminder as to why we might need to do this in the first place. And this was me, where I was struggling to notice anything positive or anything to be grateful for or anything to appreciate and i couldn't see all the great things around me that's because i took a lot for granted i have a home that is heated uh, when it were in this cold weather season i have a bed to sleep in i have electricity lights that turn on i have a hot shower that i can just step into anytime i feel cold or anytime I want to feel refreshed or just you know clean myself the, so being able to clean ourselves and brush our teeth and wash our hair uh, it shouldn't be a privilege it should be something that we all experience but it is unfortunately at this time and moment not a given these aren't things that are universal even within my own country and things that I've taken for granted and I used to gripe a little bit about not having a bathtub. Like I really want a bathtub for baths. Guess what, Shauna? You have this place that you live in by yourself. I call the shots. But more importantly than that, when we're talking about just like bathing, I have a shower, I have hot water, I can turn it on whenever I want. Like, thank you. I am grateful for that because the other option is no shower, no hot water. And so hopefully over time, if at first we don't feel the gratitude for these things that we are trying to appreciate, hopefully over time we can start feeling the gratitude 
and also hopefully we can be able to appreciate and notice more positive things around us yes i think that there's something to be said about not taking your present situation for granted and being appreciative of that and what you have totally but i also think that as we get better in this art of gratitude we can also notice more things around us to be grateful for one thing i also have that is related to this is an inspiration board above my desk and i can i think i've shown this before these are just things that you know bring a smile to my face and make me happy and it's above my workspace so i have things like leaves on there from walks with my partner i have the sticker that my friend gave to me on a bad day I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I have some paintings I painted a couple of summers ago when I was just like paintings I'm using lightly um, <laughs> where I sat down in my backyard and just like painted for two hours. I have a quote up there. I have just I have a lot of things that help me or are meant to make me feel happiness and I can just look up anytime to feel that. The third thing is to start grounding yourself in the moment. Now, there's a lot of ways to use grounding as a technique, and it's in essence a strategy to help you reconnect with your present moment. And this um, has often been a strategy used for people with like anxiety or ADHD, even depression. People who let's say spiral think or people who can get so caught up and consumed with worry or fear or distraction that there's a lot of different types of tools out there to help you do this so a cup one iteration of this is like a five by five where you expense where you spend five seconds per sense noticing things about that sense so what can i smell what can i taste touch you know here another similar way is to go through your five senses five senses but instead of spending five seconds notice five things about each sense each sense. A lot of us detach from our present moment more often than I think we think we do. We can mindlessly scroll, passively consume media, including social media, and we forget to be present. How many times have you been in a phone call or in a class and you're just on Facebook or you're scrolling through your emails or you're trying to watch a show but then you like passively scroll on your phone? I think a lot, of, a lot of us are more distracted and are passively kind of consuming life than we realize. Or I think we're just less present than we realize. I thought I was pretty good at this. I thought I was pretty good at being present. But then I noticed that sometimes I would talk to my partner and we would talk and then half an hour later when I was sending a goodnight text, I couldn't remember what he had said. Or I would zone out on uh, while watching a movie and like could not recall what had happened. Those are just some like really small examples, but also like I don't want to be the person who can't remember things about my partner's day half an hour later. Who he is and what he does and his day to day is important to me and is worth listening to. A lot of us are distracted in living our lives on autopilot. Maybe even mute or fast forward. Either way, we're not experiencing life to its fullest capacity because we're not present through it. Our presence matters. And if we're not, I think the fact that we want to zone out through our own lives or see that as desirable or okay sends a powerful message to ourselves about our own lives. Our life and the world around us as it is right now is just not enough. Our own life, the one that we created for ourselves, is uninteresting. So uninteresting that we aren't really wanting to participate in it. We'd rather be doing other things than living it. Our commutes might be long and we might be stuck in traffic and that could genuinely be annoying. Our job might not be what we want either. And I don't think you should just, you know, go out tomorrow and quit your job. It's not what I'm saying here. Uh, most of us can anyways. But I think the larger point here is that a lot of us struggle to find the good in the mundane. I think in part because we're not good at noticing uh, and appreciating the mundane, but also noticing the good things around us. I think what also happens is that 
we take we have moments that maybe aren't great or are them really mundane like getting stuck in traffic that just sucks day in and day out and then you have that commute and then you walk in your door and that being tuned out and that zone out continues past the commute. It, it, it comes into play when you walk in the door, as you prepare for dinner, at, at your dinner experience, your dinner table. Dinner time is often the only way uh, people will interact with the rest of their family members is through a meal. And so you can be zoned out in that one kind of family interaction each day. If we can't find joy or happiness in the mundane and then the majority of our life is lived in the mundane, will we ever appreciate our lives? And I I'm certainly not preaching here to be thankful or grateful for an illness or for a really bad or traumatic situation. And I'm also not saying that you can't call your commute a drag, but when we have mundane activities and we can't see past that and we also can't see the good in the rest of our day or even if there's good that happened there like your commute being especially light or especially quick or if you're dealing with something hard being able not being able to appreciate anything at all in your day can just be tough too and so finding ways back into the moment back into your every day is I think important and trying to be present to appreciate every day and to appreciate the moments and being grateful for them. I think the last kind of couple of things I talked about really linked together. Finding the good in the mundane through a gratitude practice. Grounding yourself to be present to experience your life. And then the next thing I think connects really well too because sometimes we get stuck in ruts and so I think one way to get out of a rut is to shift money from buying things to experiences and in my own life as I've been interrogating my own beliefs and just starting a journaling practice I've come to see more and more how you know I and people in my life and the world around me have not appreciated uh, the people and the things around us just one example from a recent video is that I talked about um, like Thanksgiving or um, Christmas, a holiday celebration, where I felt like my family took my mom for granted. She cooked and cleaned and opened up her house to the family and bought all the food, expensive, a lot of time and money. And yet her work was not appreciated or at the very least devalued. and. She was expected to buy gifts for other people, but also the presence of everybody who was there was somehow not good enough and we needed gifts on top of that. That we've created mundane things in our own life out of habits and routines, like coming home and then vegging out on the couch every night until you go to bed. That's the routine of a lot of people. And similarly, I think a lot of us as well have prioritize things over experiences. We value the accumulation of good, and we see that as positive, and we've put that over having experiences and being with people in our own lives. We can get so trapped in working and making money just to buy more things. We've become so busy with work and so busy with, with work, I think, for a lot of people that we no longer have time for some people in our lives and we've neglected relationships in our lives because we're so busy and then when we get home all we want to do is just like veg out on the couch and then so many of us get stuck in this cycle of working hard to buy more things to buy things to then work hard more to buy more things and then get trapped up in this cycle of wanting more things and working hard to get it and then kind of maybe shifting people and family out of the priorities of our lives and seeing them two or three times a year instead of more frequently than we wanted to. I have a separate point that I actually want to combine here. So I, I just said that a lot of us kind of get trapped up in this cycle of prioritizing things over people, working, prioritizing, or working hard, working a lot, working long hours, I mean, which is, we can talk about capitalism later, and then using that money or working hard to because we value money to buy things. And so 
On a similar note, I think that a lot of us, as I've just said, have found ourselves in ruts of watching three to five hours of TV every night. And this has become our habit and our nightly routine. And so I think a lot of us have gotten into slumps, things that don't really make us happy, but are just comfortable or used to it, or we're so tired from our day that we just kind of go to that thing that is comfortable, which is often for a lot of people that evening in front of the TV. And I think a lot of us have gotten into routines that don't really bring us a lot of joy. And we've, we've put the slumped in front of the TV over all of the other things. The things that maybe once brought us joy or would bring us joy or happiness, things that might help our creativity, just things that we love to do. And so I think a lot of us have stopped doing things that we once loved or don't do things that we're interested in because we're so busy or we don't have time or there's a lot of excuses out there, some totally valid and some just out of routines that we've cultivated for ourselves and i think a lot of us have stopped doing things or don't do things that we that we love eating a meal that you cook with your partner at home or giving yourself a manicure or doing ballet going to a dance class going to an art gallery going to a museum or even walking in the park and i think a lot of us have stifled our passions and our interests and have opted for that evening in front of the TV. And I've actually heard, I know a couple of married couples in their 50s and 60s who have said this, that like, we don't do this anymore. Like, why don't we do this? And there has just been routines that have been cultivated and almost like the passion or zest for life has kind of gone out the window in favor of those routines that have been established. And all I'm talking about is maybe creating experiences or routines that don't revolve around watching TV or don't revolve around that automatic habit that you've had. And would you experience more joy in your life if instead on a Friday night you went to the ballet? or if on Saturday afternoons you went for a walk with your family. Build in even small habits in our days that bring us more joy. And I ask you to ask yourself, what brings you joy? What have you enjoyed doing in the past? What have you maybe stopped doing? Because you deserve time to invest in your creativity and your passions and your interests. And so if nurturing your creativity and doing those things, those hobbies, those activities that are going to nurture your creativity and your zest for life even if you know going for that recliner on a friday night is what's easy i challenge you to go for the thing that's a little bit more difficult but more rewarding all right let's get into part two now and let's talk about the things that can help us keep the discontent at bay and the first thing is to set windows for shopping. This is a strategy that I've talked about previously, but it is worth reiterating here. A lot of us shop year round and there's never a moment in our year where we stop shopping or have created intention about times to shop or times to not shop. And many of us will scroll or check in our favorite retailers just out of habit. So setting boundaries on when you shop and when you can check online stores or go into a physical store will help keep your shopping intentional and what is kind of built into that is helping to keep all the things you might notice and covet and want it'll keep those things at bay because if you're seeing them less you're on the retailer's website less or if you're on instagram and you see something that you like if it's not your shopping time you can't go check in on it so you're consuming much less of the content that or you're you're off the websites that you can actually do shopping on so you will do less shopping and if you're seeing less of the new in product then you're not going to covet it as much and you're going to have less opportunity to buy it too so some strategies here like shopping windows are times of year when you can shop so you can set a one month shopping window for a capsule both for clothing and for makeup. 
You can also set daily or weekly shopping times, like my one hour on lunch is the only time of day that I can shop or check prices, um, or you know, once a week on a weekend, whatever kind of works for you. So part of this is to ensure that you're not wasting your own time on shopping and just checking in, and you could be doing other things with your life that you like more, but you're also just keeping it off and keeping the times that you wanna shop having an intention with why you're going in there in the first place. Checking a price on something is a totally valid you know, use of your time. And if you go in with that intention of here's my one hour, here's what I'm gonna use with it, then you know, you're know you spending your time wisely and you're prioritizing your time and you're keeping away from the temptation. For me, one of the biggest benefits of the window is that because you have a window, if you see something somewhere, you cannot instantly go and buy it or go check it, check up in on it. So it creates space that will hopefully help prevent impulse buying. Okay, so I think I'm looking just slightly different. I had to step out for a moment and uh, I went to Winners to get some socks. The next thing to talk about is unsubscribing from everything and creating email windows. This is one that we hear time and time again, but I do think that it bears repeating because a lot of us, well, at one point we may have unsubscribed from our most triggering online stores. A lot of us add them back. We're looking for a deal or just, you know, like right now it was just Black Friday or Cyber Monday. So you sign up for the email list, even if it's meant to be temporary, and then you're, you know, in March and you're still signed up. So I don't think it's ever a bad reminder to ourselves to remind ourselves to clean up our email list, but also even our other digital spaces like YouTube and Instagram whatever kinds of digital content you consume as well. And while we might be better at unsubscribing from email lists that trigger us and make us want to shop, I think we also need to do that a little more frequently with other digital spaces. So here, so here is your uh, invite in to do that. Another thing to do in this vein is to remove your email from your device or set up windows for checking your email. I say this not for every email that you might have, like many of us will have a work and personal email and we don't typically get ads or you know, subscribe to stores on our work emails or our school emails, but usually on our personal ones. So if we take our personal emails off our phone or we disable that notification, if we're still in a season where we are looking for a deal for something that we do already wanna buy, or you're still getting ads or you're in the process of cleaning up your inbox and you're still getting the emails, if you remove that temptation from constantly popping up and just appearing whenever it appears, it's less triggering to click to shop and to be tempted by, let's say, a deal you're not looking for. There's one thing to be like, I'm looking for a jacket from these places and then also receive a notification from like a swimwear company. And it's such a good deal you're tempted to look in anyways. The thing about emails is that they can be so intrusive and that you, if you aren't selective with your notifications or if they're on, then you don't really have control when you see them. Like anytime you open up your phone, it could just be there. And that can catch you off guard. And you're not always like having the guard up being like, I'm ready to stop shopping at this moment and it can catch you in a moment of weakness. So I'm just saying like, don't even put that temptation there and just either delete that email off your phone or remove the notifications or, or I guess it's not an or, this is an and or. Um, create times that you're gonna check your email so you're ready, you have your mental armor on, <laughs> you're ready to just clear off the inbox or just look for those specific retailers that you're actively looking to purchase from you like you know you have your focus and you're not going to be distracted by random emails popping up throughout the day i couldn't have asked for better timing and this is why i'm saying i just got some emails that i need to unsubscribe from and i need to take my own advice and not just clean up my inbox as well because this is a reminder to me but also to create some new 
boundaries with my email. The last thing to talk about is cultivating offline habits. The more you're online, the more ads you see, almost period. Even if you're not actually on an online retailer, cookies and other kind of personal data information create ads that are targeted towards you. And it's also not just ads, but the more time we spend off Instagram, YouTube, or anything that makes us feel discontent with what we have, or things that make us want to shop or promote shopping, we'll just be less tempted to shop or to feel those feelings that bring you down. The jealousy, the temptation, the, the insecurity. Deleting these apps off your phone might be a good move for you. So when you check in, it's like super intentional, like logging in on the computer. Um, or selecting specific times each day to check in on them if that is something that you still want to check in with. Um, but also spending just less time online and more time offline and cultivating habits and doing things that are just offline to get rid of that temptation and reduce it in your life. Going for walks or working out, painting, board games, any kind of art, writing, reading, anything offline, setting habits, that are offline, spending more time with people that are offline. I totally recommend if that's something that you want to do because let's face it, the less ads and the less look at my perfect life and all these amazing perfect things I have, the less we experience that often, the less tempted we'll be to buy these things and and feel that unhappiness or discontent with our own life. And it's not that social media or the internet is bad in general because many have you many of you have found this channel. I mean, I'm on YouTube, you know. And so we've built a really beautiful community here. So it's not all bad, but I think the less time that we can spend online and the more habits that we can build that are offline, if we build a habit that we really feel strengthens us and nourishes us we have more desire to do that thing and we have more reason to be offline and not just becomes easier but we feel nourished in a way that is like rewarding and fulfilling and we have that desire to keep being offline so that is today's video i would love to hear any tips or ideas that you have about cultivating contentment i'd love to hear that in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again around here soon. Bye.